Welcome to another edition of the Apostasy Report. My name is Joshua. Ravi Zacharias, unmasked indeed. Before you object, listen to the entire video. Watch the entire video immediately. Many of you will be poised to object emotionally, not factually, certainly not biblically. And as a preliminary note, let me just say this. If you are inclined to invoke Matthew 18 as a reason to dismiss or otherwise discredit anything I'm saying, please go back and read the verse in context. Matthew 18 has to do with personal sin. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him your fault between he and you alone. In the case of someone apostatizing, like Ravi Zacharias, leading other people astray through the public proclamation of error or capitulation to error, Galatians 2 is the model. Publicly withstand them. Paul did not approach Hymenaeus and Philetus personally. John did not approach Diotrephes personally, but he wrote about them publicly. They wrote about these people publicly. When error is being propagated in a public forum, Take Matthew 18 out of the equation. You're quoting it out of, out of context, um, and it's it's done in an emotional knee-jerk reaction and fashion. Stop doing that. Um, let me start by saying this. Uh, let, let, let's also address the fact that um, if any of you think that you're capable of talking to Ravi Zacharias personally, let me first just challenge you. Secure a sit-down meeting with him. Good luck. Good luck. It will never happen. So if anybody says, well, how come you didn't talk to him first? Good luck. Good luck getting a hold of him. You first. If you can get a hold of Ravi Zacharias and have a sit-down meeting with him about something like this, uh, boy, will I be impressed. It won't happen. Let me start by saying this. As a new believer in the Lord... I was uh, initially drawn to uh, Ravi Zacharias. I don't recall how I first heard of him, but suffice it to say, I spent probably an unhealthy amount of time listening to and indulging in Ravi Zacharias material, from lectures to books to curriculum. I have purchased several and read several books authored by Ravi Zacharias. I have listened to dozens, if not hundreds, of hours of lectures from Ravi Zacharias dating back to probably the late 80s. So this is coming from the perspective of one who has every reason uh, to not say this. I was heavily influenced by this man as a new believer in Christ. And I recommended him heartily to other people. He was uh, at the top of my list as a new believer. Um, And I didn't know the things that I know now, but I have heard good things from Ravi Zacharias. He He waxes eloquent. His working vocabulary is impressive. Is impressive. He he's a raconteur. He's a great storyteller. A very captivating presence. And. a seemingly formidable force when it comes to um, engaging people uh, logically in the apologetics realm. I say seemingly uh, because although he uh, is capable of addressing uh, many superficial questions, uh, theological robustness is uh, is not what exudes from Ravi Zacharias, as you're going to see here. The point in all of this is that I have listened to and been a supporter of Ravi Zacharias in my past. And because he had an influence on me, I should have uh, significantly less reason to engage in this. So for anybody who wants to say, ah, you're bitter, you're whatever, you have some vendetta, I I get this all the time about anybody. We are dealing with truth. If what I am saying and presenting is true, knock it off. 
If you don't have a biblical or factual objection to what's being said, perhaps you should cease objecting because it will be emotional babble. That's it. That's all it can be. Object biblically and or factually if you have an objection. Now, for those of you who want a detailed treatment of, uh, well, this is just uh, guilt by association and uh, w- w- what is your biblical defense? I have an entire teaching on this. Please look it up. The well over an hour long of solid, irrefutable biblical justification for everything that I'm putting forth here. It's called uh, Guilt by Association and the Danger of Sound Doctrine. But as a note, if everything you are saying is true, if, and that's a big if, but you are simultaneously affirming people who say things completely contrary to what you're saying, and in fact are teaching heresy, you are a partaker of their wicked works. It therefore nullifies the proclamations you're making. It makes them hollow. It doesn't make them untrue. It makes them hollow uh, from, uh, insofar as they're uh, emanating from you. It doesn't make the statements that you're saying false. It just makes you a hypocrite. It makes you a hollow pro- proclaimer. Second John 11. To bid someone Godspeed, to greet them who is bringing false doctrine, is to partake in, to share in their wicked works. Please go watch the entire video. This is not relegated to the heresy of Gnosticism alone. That is an absurd proposition. And I parse all of that out. Romans 16, 17. We are to mark and avoid those who are bringing false doctrine. Ephesians 5.11, etc., etc. To welcome, to extend the right hand of fellowship to those who are in error is to be in error yourself. Please watch the entire treatment. Let's begin. Ravi Zacharias, uh, several years back, was invited to speak at the Mormon Tabernacle. I'm going to try to do this somewhat chronologically so you can see a progression of regression, so to speak. Um, There was a lot of controversy over this, not so much for what he said, but for what he conspicuously left out. So let's begin, mind you, he's at the Mormon Tabernacle, speaking to the Mormon elders here. For those of you who are unaware uh, of Mormon theology, among other heresies and abominations, is their belief that Jesus and Lucifer are spirit brothers. They believe that um, Jesus is a created being, obviously. They also believe that Elohim, uh, God, the Father, is created as well. Um, There are a, a, a series of infinite gods before him, and he was a man at one time and became a god. Uh, but, but one of the Mormon maxims is, uh, uh, as as man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may become. Uh, it might be reversed in the statement, but that's the idea. God is created. Men will be gods. Jesus and Satan are spirit brothers. Uh, this is a blasphemous theology uh, and and overtly so. Did Ravi Zacharias address any of that? No, but here's what he did say. Let's let's start here. He does a marvelous job, but on a serious note, I am honored, truly honored, and privileged to stand behind this pulpit and have the opportunity of speaking, talk about the immense trust the leadership has in giving me this honor, so I do not take it lightly. And I want to thank all of the pastors for coming together and... uh, just standing together. Greg, you're a dear friend. You're a courageous man, and uh, you go through a lot of strides and uh, efforts, and it's made it possible for us to come together and flourishes. And so what brings us together? As has already been said, yes, we have our deep theological differences, but I think it's commendable that we find a common cause in trying to create a good moral soil in this culture and in this time. 
You don't have moral soil. You will not have great art. You will not have great reason. All you will find is systemic contradiction. Talk about a statement of irony. Without good moral soil, you will not have great art. You will not have great reason. And without sound theology, you do not have moral soil. Now, this is a man, this is staggering to me. This is a man who is generally known and touted for his logical and intellectual prowess. And yet here he is postulating that morality can exist apart from sound theology. It's wrong. Morality is established and hangs on the pillar of sound theology. Otherwise, how could it be moral? To what are you appealing? Moral soil? Without moral soil, we won't have good art? Now, it is true to say that um, uh, Mormons are not hostile to, uh, to evangelical Christians in the same way that Muslims are, for example. Apparently, the two can coexist more peaceably, probably, right? But to deny that Mormon theology is an absolute affront and assault on the Lord Jesus Christ himself is to, to be supremely deluded. So he says, yes, we have deep theological differences, but we, we find this common ground. We need good moral soil. You do not have good moral soil without sound theology, sound biblical theology. If you want to look at the moral soil of the racist and polygamist Mormon church, it's there in the annals of history. Why are those morals wrong? Because they contradict the biblical morals. You don't have morals. He says that um, um, that this is uh, that you ha you live in a contradictory world. And then he go he goes on to talk about pragmatism. We end up doing what works. Well, there. the The point to to notice here is. He's thanking people who worship a different Jesus, who have another gospel. The Apostle Paul said this, If we or an angel from heaven preach to you any other gospel than what you have already received, let them be accursed, anathema, literally damned. That is how serious the apostles took false gospels. Ravi Zacharias is elated. He's happy to be there. It is a privilege and an honor for him to be behind this pulpit. All these people are dear friends. And despite, you know, we do have great theological differences, but we find this common ground and we need to work together to, to create moral soil. What does that even mean? No, they have a false gospel. And therefore, even if all of their outward conduct were uh, clearly and decidedly in accord with everything written in the Bible, it would still undermine it. You don't get to believe false things about Jesus and then live this outward uh, life of, you know, biblical standards. What are we really talking about here? What Ravi Zacharias is saying without saying it is that truth doesn't matter, which is ironic and crazy given that uh, most of his spiel is about the necessity of truth and how we can't divorce reason from spirituality. And yet he's an expert in doing exactly that. He is an expert in diplomacy, not in biblical fortitude. So he's elated. He's elated to be with them. And he concludes here. Uh, let's see. Change the outside until we have changed within. Let the word of God be found again in our places of worship, in our churches, any place that claims to know him, let the word of God be central and let worship be the consummate expression of all that you and I really are. The word and worship, once we do that, the world will see the beauty 
that is Christ's and one to follow him. Notice the language. We, our, us. He is giving the clear and distinct impression that despite their differences, there is some unity, some harmony between them. Let the word of God be found in our places of worship. He's speaking in the Mormon tabernacle. This is a collective audience of Mormons. Our places of worship. People will want to follow Jesus. Here's the problem. They're using the same terminology with radically different meanings. They say the name Jesus. So when he says Jesus, what does that mean to them? Well, they have an idea of Jesus. And it's a wrong idea. It's a false idea. It's ultimately a demonic idea. But never once does Ravi Zacharias say, I must be very clear here. The Jesus that I am representing is different than the Jesus you are representing. There is another Jesus and another gospel emanating from this abomination. I came here to call you to repentance, lest you be consumed in your folly. That's not what he said. He's a diplomat. Public relations is what drives him, not truth. You think the apostles would have not said what needed to be said in relation to the false Jesus that is worshipped by the Mormons? A created Jesus and therefore a Jesus that cannot save you? You're saved by, uh, by, by faith after you've done all you can do. The works-based, uh, completely backward, so-called gospel of, of the Mormonism, of Mormonism? No. Ravi acknowledges he received some heat over this, and as he should have. So here begins, arguably this began uh, prior to this, but this was a really big um, shifting point in the ministry of Ravi Zacharias, and a, many you know, were none too pleased about it. His failure to and reluctance to say what needed to be said was a window into his lack of desire for truth, though he would say otherwise. Ravi extends fellowship to the Mormons. So it begins and continues with Joyce Meyer. Now, I am supposing that most people listening to this know who Joyce Meyer is. I am supposing that most people understand that Joyce Meyer is synonymous with false teaching and what is commonly referred to as the prosperity gospel. Word of faith, ideologies, the name it and claim it crowd, etc. I'm assuming you know that. I'll give you a couple of examples, but here's what Ravi Zacharias did on Joyce Meyer's television program. Here you go. Welcome back. Dr. Ravi Zacharias is with me today, and we're getting ready to discuss the question, what is truth? What is truth? You know, it's interesting in the Gospel of John, the 18th chapter, and you're such a great Bible teacher in these things, I'm sure you're dealt with them before. You're such a great Bible teacher in these things, I'm sure you're dealt with them before. You're such a great Bible teacher in these things, I'm sure you're dealt with them before. Okay, she's such a great Bible teacher, according to Ravi Zacharias. Uh, this is shocking. Um, not only is she not a great Bible teacher, she is one of the greatest bad Bible teachers, if I could use a phrase. Now, again, I'm supposing that most of you have done your homework and understand that Joyce Meyer is a multi-millionaire profiteer and charlatan extraordinaire. But, lest you still need some convincing, let me, let me appeal to the Joyce Meyer study Bible, which I have as a, as a study. Uh, study resource, not because I consult her. I have an entire shelf marked heresy and apostasy for research purposes, right? Uh, and in fact, uh, I forget where I found this, but it was, uh, I don't want anybody else to come across this and be deceived by it. But this is Joyce Meyer's printed study Bible, okay? There you go. 
She has a whole section here in uh, Matthew chapter 19. Uh, these are her notes. Love yourself. Love yourself. One of the greatest problems many people have today is that they do not think well of themselves. They need to know that God's word teaches them to love themselves. Here's her proof of it. Since the Lord commands us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, see Matthew 19, 19, he must think that it is as important to love ourselves as it is to love others. But it is not enough just to love ourselves. We must also like ourselves. And then she goes on to provide some anecdotes about how she learned this. Um, so here's the whole big section on love yourself. And her proof of this is that Jesus says to love your neighbor as yourself. But notice what Jesus didn't say in that verse. He didn't say love yourself. There's a presupposition that as fallen men and women, we are, uh, we are predisposed to loving ourselves, predisposed to not hating our flesh. He doesn't say make sure you love yourself. He says Love other people as you already do yourself. Moreover, and I'm just, we're going to make short work of this. Let's just, Joyce Meyer says, love yourself. The Bible teaches us to love ourselves and to like ourselves. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this, verse 1, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, etc., disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving. The first two things on the list are this. As an indication that perilous times are upon us is that men will be lovers of themselves and lovers of money. Lovers of money. Uh, in the book of Philippians, uh, I think it's in chapter 2, uh, it says to um, esteem others as better than yourself. The constant admonition in the Bible is the exact opposite of what Joyce Meyer uh, propagates. We are exhorted to love God and to love others. It's not about loving ourselves. If you know yourselves, if, if, if you have truly understood the depth of your own depravity and understood even a little bit of the holiness of God, you will, with Paul, say, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? There is nothing inherently lovable about me. When you understand that, you get your eyes off of yourself and on to God. You love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's not about loving yourself. It's not even about liking yourself. What does Paul say? It's, it's not me, but Christ lives in me. If there is anything redeemable whatsoever, it's not me, it's Christ. If there is anything good or wholesome in me, it is not me, it's Christ. I don't need to love myself. I need to love Christ. I don't need to accept myself or like myself. It's a backwards way of thinking. The goal should be to get rid of self. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified to this world. It's not about us, but Joyce Meyer is the quintessential lover of self and lover of money. The first two indications that perilous times are upon us. Men and women will be lovers of themselves and lovers of money. Here's a, a clip from a, a Nightline interview in 2010 that has been scrubbed from the internet. All but scrubbed. It's in another video here. Even ABC's own website has removed it. You can't find it anywhere. But here's what Joyce Meyer says. Here's what she teaches. There's a major part of the whole Christian but do you believe that if someone gives money to the ministry, right. that more will come back to them? Yes. Absolutely. Back to them? Yes. Absolutely. She, yes, absolutely believes that if somebody gives money to her, more will come back to them. 
Gee, you know, I remember Jesus saying, when you, when you give something, give not expecting anything in return. When you, when you uh, host a party or, th- or a gathering, invite people who can't pay you back. Don't expect anything in return. This is, um, this is so radically backward and, again, the epitome of what is known as the prosperity gospel. God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise and, and uh, to prosper in all things. They'll, they'll uh, misquote, uh, what is it, Third John, I think? Maybe uh, Third John verse 2. Um, Joyce Meyer issued uh, this ambiguous uh, recant uh, not long ago saying, you know, I'm glad about what I learned about prosperity, but it, w- it got out of balance. And I'm glad about what I learned about faith, but it got out of balance. Well, this wasn't a recant. Um, this was a statement to, to assuage criticisms that are pff, viable and, and nonstop toward her. She's a multi-millionaire Jezebel uh, whose husband lives in her shadows uh, wearing a skirt, figuratively. Joyce Meyer is a false teacher, and Ravi Zacharias says she's a great Bible teacher. You're such a great Bible teacher in these things. You're a great Bible teacher. This alone, if this were the only thing Ravi ever said that was wrong, it would be bad enough. Ravi Zacharias commends the ministry of Joyce Meyer and calls her a great Bible teacher. Then a man asks Ravi Zacharias a question about homosexuality. Here's his answer, part of it. One of the greatest saints of recent memory was Henry Nouwen. If you've read any books by Henry Nouwen, Henry Nouwen was a professor of uh, uh, psychology at Harvard University. And some years ago, he went to um, St. Petersburg in, in Russia, and, uh, and then he went to a uh, professor of uh, uh, sub recent memory. Greatest disposition. No, I've talked to people who do. One of the greatest saints of recent memory was Henry Nouwen. Okay, we'll stop there. He, he goes on to give a long story about how Henry Nouwen sat before this painting, and he looked at it for uh, four hours, and, and um, the whole... Uh, the point of his story was uh, he had homosexual tendencies but decided not to act on them. Okay. The point to notice here is how he opens this. Henry Nouwen, he says, is one of the greatest saints of recent memory. One of the greatest... Now, to, to, a, to a new believer, to somebody who doesn't know better, who's hearing many true things from him, immediately... They are being led into the arms of a Henry Nouwen or a Joyce Meyer or the Mormon Tabernacle. After all, Ravi didn't call them heretics. He didn't say they preach a false gospel. He said we have differences. But we're both working toward that moral soil, aren't we? Who is Henry Nouwen? He says he's one of the great saints of our of recent memory. Henry Nouwen. Well, Here's an excerpt from a, uh, a documentary on Henry Nouwen. Just listen to how he's described by others, first of all. Henry brought an enormous ecumenical sensitivity to the Yale campus. Henry brought an enormous ecumenical sensitivity to the Yale campus. Henry Nouwen, well, was a Catholic uh, mystic. To Listen again. To the Yale campus, inviting students of every denominational background to join with him for the Eucharist. Inviting students of every denominational background to join with him in the Eucharist. Henry Nouwen was not only a Catholic, but he was a mystic Catholic who was clearly ecumenical. That's what he was known for joining hands with everybody and singing Kumbaya. That's what we are dealing with in the person and the so-called ministry of Ravi Zacharias is ecumenism and apostasy. So he says, Henry Nouwen, one of the great saints of our ages. Well, here's a quote from Henry Nouwen in his, uh, uh, let's see, from uh, the book titled Sabbatical Journey, his last book. 1998 hardcover edition, page 51, says this, Today I personally believe that while Jesus came to open the door to God's house, all human beings can walk through that door whether they know about Jesus or not. Listen, today I see it 
as my call to help every person claim his or her own way to God. Uh, there are several, several quotes here in, in this article from Henry Nouwen. That's really what you need to know about Henry Nouwen, is that even by classic Catholic terms, he's not even a good Catholic. Today I see it as my personal... Uh, my call to help every person pr proclaim his or her own way to God. This heretical, blasphemous, and biblically bankrupt comment from Henry Nouwen, and yet Ravi Zacharias says he's one of the great saints of recent memory. One of the great saints. A Catholic mystic, Henry Nouwen, one of the great saints. Uh, I mean, he, he, he sp spoke at, uh, you know, Robert Schuller's Power Hour in the Glass Cathedral and and uh, has had a tremendous impact on many superficial, um, spiritually inclined people. Why? Well, because he appeals to everybody. Why is that? Because he doesn't appeal to the Bible. But this is nothing new for Ravi Zacharias. He will routinely quote people like G.K. Chesterton and Malcolm Muggridge, Smart men? Sure. In some ways. So was Bertrand Russell. So was Christopher Hitchens. Yet they denied God overtly. But he constantly appeals to Catholics as being great sources of uh, theology and being great saints of our time. Here's a quick picture of Ravi Zacharias with the degenerate apostate Lecrae. In an upcoming edition of the Apostasy Report, Lord willing, we will be covering the entire Christian music industry. And when I say entire, I mean entire. Buckle up for that one. Lecrae will certainly be featured in that. Ravi Zacharias and Lecrae. By the way, Lecrae is also a good friend of Paul Washer. Personal friend. Paul Washer has never repudiated that friendship despite his apostate friend's headlong involvement with Hillsong United, the Passion Conference, race baiting, etc. You know, being a, a guest at the BET Awards and on all these ungodly, worldly radio stations. Uh, Lecrae could not be worse for Christianity. He entices people to look like and behave like the world. But Ravi Zacharias is also a friend of Lecrae sharing his heart and vision to reach our culture with the hope of Jesus Christ through music and the arts. Lecrae is hoping to reach the culture for his own pocketbook. It's certainly not for Christ. Lecrae is one of the lovers of self we read about in 2 Timothy. Ravi Zacharias, August 29th and 2015, says, I'm preaching at Hillsong Church today. Hillsong Church on the integrity of Christian worship. Wow. One of my favorite subjects to speak on. And we as the church must understand. Ravi, a few years back, preaching at Hillsong. I assume most of you know who Hillsong is. But if you don't, let's just take, uh, let's take a quick listen to Hillsong's founder, Brian Houston. Here's the founder of Hillsong Church talking about Christians and Muslims. Listen carefully. We serve the same God. We actually serve take it all the way back in the same desert they both find what they're looking for sweet nectar he's talking about he's talking about two birds in the same desert listen lives off the beautiful dead carcasses and there's hummingbirds there's vultures vultures and there's hummingbirds hummingbirds in the same desert one lives off dead carcasses okay. rotting meat the other lives off the beautiful sweet nectar in a particular flower on a particular desert plant so they're both in the same desert same desert they both find what they're looking both for. both find what they're looking for you know if you take it all the way back into the old testament and the muslim and you we actually serve the same god allah to a muslim to us our father god if you take it all the way back to the old testament the muslim and you we actually serve the same god allah to the muslim to us abba father same god Different name, same God. This isn't particularly shocking coming from a man who wrote a book entitled, You Need More Money. Yes, Brian Houston authored that book. Again, not particularly shocking coming from a man who uh, 
apparently covered up his father's pedophilia for years. Frank Houston, look into it. Brian Houston is uh, not merely a theological degenerate, but he is a a wolf among wolves. He is a word of faith teacher who has somehow made uh, inroads into and created a new denomination, really. He's made inroads into evangelicalism. But Hillsong itself is its own denomination. And they... Uh, they work their way in like a parasite to these churches and eventually take them over. This is a, a bit of an M.O. for Hillsong. And the church is, it then becomes, um, it's absorbed by Hillsong. And it becomes an, a Hillsong. This has happened in multiple cases. But this is Brian Houston. Brian Houston says Muslims and Christians serve the same God. Ravi Zacharias supports Hillsong. He preaches at their church. Uh, but here he is doing a whole symposium with Hillsong and lauding how great they are. Listen. And so I think it's about 200 plus that have come, pastors and leaders from churches, Joel, just as a remarkable, admired, respected, beloved leader. And Hillsong, you know, just a fantastic uh, model being set across the globe. Their music is so well heard and wonderfully uh, treasured by this generation. And uh, to have the opportunity now for us to speak and teach is a unique gift and a wonderful honor given to us by the Lord. Song, you know, just a fantastic uh, model being set across the globe. Then a fantastic model being set across the globe by Hillsong. A unique privilege and an honor, says Ravi Zacharias. Ravi Zacharias is privileged and honored to be working with Hillsong, and um, can't speak highly enough about them. Let's go back to Brian Houston, the founder of Hillsong, in an interview he did with Mark Driscoll, former uh, founder and leader of Mars Hill Church in, uh, I believe it was Seattle, uh, Washington, and uh, Upper West Coast, and who uh, was uh, uncovered uh, as having plagiarized in his book and bullied people and uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, was one of the pioneers of the Young, Restless, and Reformed group and um, uh, really uh, stoked the fires of uh, young, ignorant Calvinists who were just enamored with paper theology. Uh, and yet Mark Driscoll is a fraud. And when he fell out of the graces of the big Christian circuit, Conference Christianity, uh, Mark Driscoll invited Rick Warren to a conference he did in 2013, along with uh, Greg Laurie and Crawford Loritz and some others. Uh, but Mark Driscoll's not beyond palling around with Rick Warren, who is a an ecumenical heretic himself. Uh, nevertheless, Mark Driscoll was invited to a Hillsong conference, and uh, he was protested heavily by uh, uh, women that uh, believed he had said things that at least teetered on, if not were misogynistic in nature. And so he was disinvited by Brian Houston, but they still did an interview with him and then played it remotely at the conference. Well, here's an excerpt from that interview from Mark Driscoll's own website. Uh, listen to Brian Houston, who his friends are, and uh, again, this is somebody that Ravi Zacharias promotes. I've always had a huge personal problem with people doing that, people criticising other yeah. pastors, even though perhaps we are different on some yeah. issues, you know. And Joel Osteen is a personal friend of mine. Yeah. And so, again, one of the first things I knew about you yeah. was, uh, you know, that you talked about Joel publicly. So when I first met you, I was paranoid because the last thing I wanted was Mark Driscoll <laughs> speaking against me publicly. Yeah, I can... I think in the providence of God, I can honestly say it was a couple of weeks ago that the Lord convicted me of that sin against Pastor Joel. And so I, through a mutual friend, have contact with his team um, and have asked uh, permission to send him a private apology. But in addition to that, I appreciate this opportunity to publicly apologize to him. Uh, so Brian Houston is close personal friends with Joel Osteen, which isn't a surprise to anybody who's uh, done a little bit of research here. Uh, they're both of the same cloth. 
Brian Houston is uh, just has more laser lights in his show. Joel Osteen appears to be more conventional, maybe a little more old school, right? Uh, he's an old school heretic, and Brian Houston's just a little flashier about it. But he says, the first time I heard about you, Mark, was criticizing Joel Osteen, who's a personal friend of mine. Mind you, this is the ministry that Ravi Zacharias supports and lauds. A Joel Osteen lover and friend of Joel Osteen. Mark Driscoll then says, it was recently that the Lord convicted me of this sin. Now, let me just say, of all the things Mark Driscoll should have repented of, this was not one of them. Of all the things Mark Driscoll was guilty of, criticizing Joel Osteen was not one of them. The one thing Mark Driscoll said that did not need to be repented of, the one thing he should have said emphatically and could have reinforced is the thing he repented of. Ironically, his repentance of that is a new sin. His recanting of a criticism of a demonically inspired Joel Osteen is itself a new sin. He's only heaping sin onto himself. And why? Because he's desperate to reclaim the spotlight that was lost. But that's a side note. Amazing. Of all the things Mark Driscoll said and did that were wrong, uncalled for, etc., this was not one of them. I could heartily stand behind Mark Driscoll in his criticism of Joel Osteen and say, Amen, Joel Osteen is a false teacher and a wolf. Here he repents of it because nobody's inviting him to conferences anymore and his career as a hireling is not looking so good. But Brian Houston is a close personal friend of Joel Osteen. Let's not forget Ravi Zacharias loves Hillsong. He's uh, privileged to be a part of uh, Hillsong. Well, I don't know where it was. <clears throat> Here's just a brief highlight of, uh, and, and, and to reinforce the idea that Joel Osteen and Brian Houston are, in fact, good friends. Uh, this is uh, Hillsong 2013. You can see Joel Osteen, uh, T.D. Jakes, and some others speaking at the Hillsong Conference. What is now your test will soon become your testimony. Why? Because God is in complete control of that storm. If God be for us, who dare be against us? Amen. God's not for you. Look at this nonsense. Are you kidding me? This is the great model, Ravi says, is being implemented worldwide. This to do Tom this Fullery. One thing and this one thing only to preach the gospel and share Craig Groeschel, LifeChurch.tv, the, the, the guy that cre created the YouVersion Bible app. Heresy. That's the sound of your next opportunity. T.D. Jakes, the modalist. It's passing by. I don't have time to sit back and worry about what you think because the glory of the Lord is passing by. Crazy. Crazy. Joel Osteen and Brian Houston are close personal friends. This is the great model being set worldwide that Gra Ravi Zacharias lauds. That he is privileged and honored to support. But if that weren't enough, let's check out uh, Hillsong 2015. Do you want to have a competition see who do the most? No, sir. Look at this runway. It's a waste not to use it. That's what you use it for, not for push-ups. By the way, this is their official highlight video. I didn't make these or compile these. This is what they're promoting. Joseph Prince, the hyper-grace heretic, prancing around like it's a runway. Talk about clowns. This is what Hillsong is all about. Cheap entertainment because there is no substance. Word of faith, superficial spirituality. It's spirituality devoid of truth. Tune in to the voice of God. Gentizen Franklin. If any of you know who that is, uh, much more could be said. Greatness. Have nothing He's to do with him. You to outrageous. You reign in life. The devil doesn't. When you reign in life, your addictions don't. Grace is not a teaching. Grace Christine Kane. The lost and a broken world in all aware that are dying with our church. Speak, church! 
Judah Smith, best buddy of Carl Lentz. We're listed mouth is the love of Jesus. They say Jesus, but they have nothing in common. Oh, who's that? Yeah, that's our old buddy Rick Warren. That's right. Rick Warren and Brian Houston are good friends too. Gosh, Rick Warren, I believe he first – he was at a Hillsong conference as early as 2006, I believe it was. T.D. Jakes was also there. Christine was also there, Christine Kane. Uh, Joseph Prince was also there. So since the Hillsong conferences have become this formidable force in conference Christianity and, and arguably uh, set the pace and the trend for other uh, lovers of self to follow, Rick Warren has been a part of it. T.D. Jakes has been a part of it. Christine Kane, Joseph Prince, uh, Word of Faith, Ecumenism, etc., etc. Hillsong is uh, is is one of the most prolific progenitors of apostasy that I'm aware of. Prolific in the sense that they are. Gosh, the the, the most uh, recognizable, uh, the the seemingly limitless resources at their disposal. Hillsong is setting the tone for what is becoming um, just careless carousing. Uh, Hillsong 2018 highlights. Just a couple of quick... In his image, there is more. If you're still living under the condemnation of bondage of sin, look to Jesus. Look at the grace and the goodness, which is the glory of God. There is more. You do belong in your sphere. You are graced, you are gifted, and you are called to that sphere. The best gift we can give someone else is a better us. What's most... Ooh, neat, a Mustang. What's powerful for all of us is if we change before we have to. We're going to begin to realize we're in the midst of this incredible God-breathed miracle. You can turn things around. You can turn... Yeah, this isn't a God-breathed miracle. It is a Satan-inspired abomination in every possible way. Uh, this could not be... It, it's almost ridiculous. It's amazing that something this overtly nonsensical, worldly, and appealing to the flesh has gained so many inroads. But the quintessential example of how in the last days men will heap up to themselves false teachers because they have itching ears. This is what they want. They want to be entertained. And Ravi Zacharias says it's an honor and a privilege to see this amazing model that's being established all over the globe. Just so in bit of a Amazing. Young and free, confident name of Jesus. And another believer can say, I'm not going to let you sit down. I'm not going to let you win again. To be ashamed or afraid to in the kitchen looks different. He wants to give you more. See, that guy John Gray right there was a former um, co-minister with Joel Osteen at Lakewood Church until he got the opportunity to go and start his own. Uh, this is just a small window into the heresy factory that is Hillsong that Ravi Zacharias supports and loves. Rick Warren at Hillsong. Not surprising. Not surprising. Here's a message from Ravi Zacharias on Facebook just a couple of years ago. Deeply honored and privileged to be speaking here at Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California, for their annual uh, Amazon Apologetics lecture, sh lecture series. Under the leadership of my respected friend, Rick Warren, and his able team, this church has touched the world with life-changing impact. Truly one of the great churches of our time and across time. I'm praying for God's presence and power uh, in and through these messages. I am blessed just to be here. It's almost comical how bad this is. His respected friend, Rick Warren, he calls Saddleback Church uh, truly one of the great churches of our time and across time. This, this is the church that invites uh, yoga ex experts uh, and... Um, uh, Inter, not even interdenominational, uh, interreligious dialogue. Rick Warren is one of the key figures in the modern ecumenical movement. Uh, and uh, meeting with uh, 
Islamic leaders and uh, Jewish leaders and uh, Buddhist leaders and anybody who will have him bridging gaps everywhere, uh, saying to Elton John, if I kissed you, this would be the kiss heard around the world because, you know, we have to fight for AIDS. It's humanitarian efforts without truth. Rick Warren is an antichrist, one of many. But Ravi Zacharias calls Rick Warren his respected friend. Here's Ravi Zacharias at Saddleback Church. Thank you, and it's great to be here. Uh, I was saying earlier that uh, uh, Rick happens to be in the city of Hyderabad, which is the first city in which, in which I preached my sermon, the first sermon. I was 19 years old. At that time, it was a youth preacher contest, and so it happens. So he goes on to talk about how I'm here and he's there, and uh, be careful with the questions in India. Rick Warren is his respected friend. So you got Ravi uh, playing footsies with the Mormons. You got Ravi saying Joyce Meyer's a great Bible teacher. You've got Ravi honored and privileged to be a part of Hillsong ch uh, Church and, and, and to witness the model that's being set worldwide. You've got Ravi um, absolutely elated that he is um, there with Rick Warren, and uh, that's his respected friend. Here's, here's his respected friend's comments on Catholicism. You see, people will listen to what we say if they like what they see. We? And uh, as, as our new pope, he was very, very symbolic in, you know, his first mass with people of AIDS, uh, his, his uh, kissing of, uh, of the disformed man. The pope Francis is the perfect example of this. Hmm. He, is a, he is doing everything right. You see, people will listen. That's what a Christian does. I, in fact, there's a headline here in Orange County, and I love the headline. I saved it. It said, if you love Pope Francis, you'll love Jesus. <laughs> oh, that, that was a headline? That was a headline. Oh. It was a headline. I saved it. I showed it to a group of priests I was uh, speaking to. Rick Warren is not merely a dangerous man, but as I said, he is operating in the spirit of an antichrist. Rick Warren claims that his grandfather or great-grandfather, forget which, was converted under the ministry of Charles Spurgeon, and Rick Warren claims to be a Baptist and is, um, we'll talk about Charles Spurgeon from time to time, at least to name drop, right? So he plays all these sides of the aisle. Well, Rick Warren, the Pope lover and ecumenist over here, um, says things radically different than Charles Spurgeon, for example, who said, um, it is the bounden duty for Christians to pray against Antichrist. And as to what Antichrist is, no sane man ought to raise an objection. If it be not the popery of Rome, there is nothing on earth that can be called by that name. He continues on in, in the ways that popery robs Christ of his glory. This man says, Pope Francis is doing everything right. If you love Pope Francis, you'll love Jesus. This is Ravi's respected friend. Here you go. Sometimes Protestants think that Catholics, Catholics worship Mary like she's another god. But that's not exactly Catholic doctrine. There's the understanding, and, and people say, well, what are the saints all about? Are, you know, you're, why are you praying to the saints? For any of you who are even mildly familiar with Catholicism, depending on the region you live in, uh, it is very common to find churches that are named Our Lady of whatever. Uh, to say that they don't uh, venerate Mary to a godlike stat status is at best ignorant and very likely just deceptive. Statues of Mary are literally bowed down before. They believe in a perpetual virginity and that she is something of a co-redemptrix, um, that she aids in your salvation as well. And when you understand what they mean by what they're saying, there's a whole lot more commonality. Now, there's still real differences, oh. no, no doubt about that. But the most important thing is, if you love Jesus, we're on the same team. Rick Warren um, doing his best to lead people into the arms of 
arguably the man that most embodies Antichrist alive uh, and, and the position that is most uh, is represented most clearly what Antichrist is all about. This man calls himself Holy Father. This is Ravi Zacharias's respected friend, Rick Warren. Here's Rick Warren at the Muslim Public Affairs Council convention in, uh, I think this was 2008. Assalamu alaikum. I want you to know how deeply and profoundly and truly humbled I am to be with you here tonight. Of all the people in the world, you invited me. I love Mahar Hatut, the founder of Impact. He, uh, he is a dear friend of mine. He is a genius. Genius. If you haven't read his book on justice, you need to read his book on justice. So who is this dear friend and genius friend of Rick Warren uh, whose book we need to read on justice? Maharathu, uh, who was ambiguously Muslim, but more properly a universalist, not even a good Muslim. Here you go. It is very clear that the will of God is diversity. The will of God is for his servants to take different paths towards him. And when we appreciate that, we'll appreciate each other. And we will really change our attitude completely. And He's speaking in a Catholic church, mind you. What is this? I think it's All Saints Church in uh, Pasadena. And radically towards each other. And the Quran goes on saying, then in that another group in the mosque, another group will be tested in this room will be. So I assume that the majority of people here in this room will be tested up to the level of the Bible, of the gospel of Jesus and his teachings. Another group in the mosque will be tested and questioned about how did they behave vis-a-vis -vis what the Quran gave them. If there is a synagogue around the corner, I believe that people there will be questioned and tested how much following, real following and actualization of the values of the Torah. So God is telling us here in a very clear language I will not be tested about you, you will not be tested about me. Each one of them is challenged to live up to the high level and the standard that God told you about. The verse ends by saying... Again, this, and he, and he goes through these uh, same thing. He, he reiterates the point. God's servants take different paths to him. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Jew. Again, he is the founder of the Muslim, Muslim Public Affairs Council. And, um, and yet a devout Muslim would laugh at him and call him very likely an apostate of the Muslim faith. He's not even a good Muslim. But Rick Warren says this man's a genius. And if you haven't read his book on justice, you need to read it. Uh, let me tell you, no, you don't. Not only do you not need to read it, you need to not read it. Maybe that was redundant. Don't read his book on justice. Unless you're doing it to critique it. Unless you're doing it to find out just what uh, level of uh, theological bankruptcy Rick Warren promotes. Again, Ravi Zacharias calls Rick Warren a respected friend and his church is one of the great churches across all ages. Rick Warren, the ecumenist, pope lover, Islamic, he calls this universalist, ambiguous Muslim, a genius. That's Rick Warren. Here's Ravi Zacharias hanging out with uh, the New Apostolic Reformation's own Francis Chan. Recently. 
He is like a conductor and the whole world is his orchestra. Love that. Absolutely love it. I used to be like that. Then I got older. <laughs> they're doing a big Q&A session. The point is they're not only friendly, they are friends. They support each other. And they have been for quite some time uh, in the realm of the Passion Conference uh, put on by Louis Giglio, the Pope Kisser, which we'll get to shortly. And uh, they were also at the uh, 2016 Together Fill the Mall event. Uh, if you have not seen the apostasy report I did about Francis Chan, Francis Chan the Deceiver, please watch it. Francis Chan embraces and endorses everyone from uh, Mike Bickle to Lou Engel to Benny Hinn to Todd White, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's just get a brief uh, look here. People call prosperity some kind of twisted doctor. God wants you to be in good health, and he wants you to prosper. What the prosperity gospel teaches is, hey, be surprised if there's any type of trial in your life because you should be experiencing. Man, he's our heavenly. It would appear that in Francis Chan's old speeches that he uh, took issue with some of the elements of the prosperity gospel and even some of his current statements. However, his actions blatantly contradict his statements, making Francis Chan a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Father, he wants us to experience the best. The devil doesn't ever want you to get a revelation of finances, ever. Because if he does, he loses control of you. You know, you should be... I don't know how to say this. Todd White is, is a complete and utter spiritual moron. That's the nicest thing I can say. What he's saying is moronic and deceptive. Treated like kings when Paul's saying the exact opposite. People get attitudes with this. Get over you. I could care less what you think right now about this. I don't know if you guys ever heard of Benny Hinn. Some of you are like, I don't care what you think. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to be sick. And nobody wants to be poor. Well, God's will is health. Come on. God's will is life, health, and prosperity. It's in the Bible. Gosh, there has been some... Hmm. Health and prosperity. It's in the Bible. How did that work out for those penniless prophets who were sawed in two and martyred? And Gosh, I don't re recall Paul having a, a... What did Peter say? Silver and gold, have I none? And then what happened to Peter? He was uh, crucified upside down. Yeah, that's right. How about Jesus? The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. When they came to gather taxes, he told Peter to go get a fish and cut it open and there'll be tax money for us. Not a whole lot of prosperity floating around the Messiah himself, you degenerate liars. Prosper spiritually. Prosper in obedience. Prosper in holiness. Biblical prosperity is measured by your adherence to God's mandates, by your obedience to him, and by your growth in holiness, and therefore proximity to him. And very often, it will include a loss of things. It will include tribulation and persecution. Amazing teaching today. That's the first time I heard Todd preach live, and I'm going, oh my gosh, these are bold, bold men of God. Again, watch the entire video I did on Francis Chan if you have any other questions about that. This is uh, somebody who Ravi Zacharias pals around with on a relatively consistent basis. Here they are in 2016 at the Fill the Mall event, a.k.a. Together 2016. Again, there's uh, Lecrae up here. Paul Washer's personal friend, Jeremy Camp, Ravi Zacharias down here. You've got Trip Lee, Josh McDowell, Josh McDowell, leading apologist of yesteryear, old man who should know better, gallivanting around with this apostate crowd. W what a travesty. Where are we? Shame on you, Josh McDowell. Evidence that demands a verdict. This demands th this demands a verdict, too. What were you doing at an ecumenical gathering in which Pope Francis himself gave the opening statement? Absolutely crazy. Lauren Daigle, Francis Chan, Christine Kane, Nick Hall. This is the together. Uh, this is just a very short list. There were many other people there. Of course, Hillsong United was there to sing songs. Hardly could call it worship. 
Here's one brief example of what happened, arguably the main thrust of the event. We are attracted to unity. E anche noi cattolici. These two men are Catholics from the Vatican. Ci siamo venuti a dare questa testimonianza. And we, even Catholics, have come to bring this testimony. I had the chance to travel to meet Pope Francis, the Vatican. Now, now this is their own documentary. Just one of these. This is the Together's official documentary. Nick Hall is the man that organized and orchestrated this entire event that Ravi Zacharias was pleased to attend and engage in. Things we've been praying for, that God would open up a door with the Catholic Church. Can I give you a hug? Sí. Then when we're there being told we're going to shoot the video that Pope Francis is going to be recording. Well, we didn't bring a videographer. With so this, there you go, together, the whole thing was, uh, let's see if you sh I'm showing the shirt. There you go, together. That was the whole thrust, together. They brought the ecumenical delegation from the Vatican to petition unity between Catholics and Protestants, and of course had Pope Francis there issuing the opening address. And uh, where is it? Oh, yeah, oh, who's, yeah, Ravi Zacharias was, was part of the entire event, part of their documentary. He spoke there with Nabil Qureshi, who uh, had an untimely death a couple years ago due to cancer. And um, there's Ravi Zacharias engaged in, partaking in gross ecumenism capitulating to Rome. Here's the own, his own website, RZIM. Uh, looking at the uh, pictures from Together 2016, people ask what it's like to have an audience so vast. Limited time to give a message. I just want to say a big thank you to Nick Hall and his team. Right from the start, they were focused on getting the message of Jesus to this generation. Notice it's always in vague terms. They say the word Jesus and subtract any truth. Uh, that would substantiate the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible would do none of the things that they are doing. He wouldn't be invited to these events. They would pick up stones to stone him. Why? Because Jesus did not hold his tongue when error was being propagated, especially doctrinal error. The cost and time and energy, uh, there was selflessness. It was so appealing. I commend Pulse for this monumental effort. May the Lord honor you even as you have honored him. Praising this event that was arguably centered around the appeal for unity between Catholics and Protestants. Which the, the, well, the word Protestantism doesn't have any force behind it anymore. There's no such thing as Protestants anymore. There's no protesting. The memorable honor is to be with some of the most effective evangelical voices in message and song. It's so easy to, well, just Ravi singing the praises. I see a large crowd. I see an opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I say a heartfelt thank you. We are all on that bridge, he says. Let his voice be heard. And for those who uh, he has raising, uh, raises up to bring about those settings. I say a heartfelt thank you with uh, also to the thousands that have written in to encourage us. You'll never know how encouraging your words are. That's Ravi Zacharias praising the ecumenical event he attended with Francis Chan as well. Again, from his own website, uh, this was the uh, World Summit. The summit is hosted by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, no stranger to ecumenism. And participants include a broad array of Protestant, Roman Catholic, and Orthodox leaders. Over 600 victims and advocates from 130 countries are gathering to help raise global awareness about the plight of persecuted Christians and, show, and to show solidarity with those who suffer because of their faith. Other speakers include Cardinal Donald Wuerl, Bishop Michael Nasir Ali, and Reverend Sam Dogger. Okay, this is where this is on RZIM's own website, something that they promoted, something uh, that Ravi Zacharias spoke at. Uh, one of the other speakers that joined him was this guy, Cardinal Donald Whirl. Well, as the title would suggest, he's a cardinal in the Catholic Church, and there he is with his friend and cohort and abominations, uh, Pope Francis, the one whom Rick Warren says is um, doing everything right. If you love Pope Francis, says Rick Warren, you'll love Jesus, Ravi Zacharias' respected friend. Here he is answering a question about Catholicism. Is Roman Catholicism a cult? He just can't answer the question. He basically says, well, you know, you can be, 
you can be a good Catholic and a bad Christian. He won't say, he won't denounce it, but here's what he will say. I know many people, whether they're in Protestantism or in Roman Catholicism, who are truly followers of Jesus Christ. There are many other aspects of their faith that they may not fully subscribe to. That is an accretion across history that was added by the power of leadership or by the power. Okay, he knows many people that are Catholics, that are uh, great believers in Jesus. Again, among, one, uh, uh, among them would be Henry Nouwen, who he says is one of the great saints of the ages. Now he says, uh, in a preemptive defense of them, there may be many other aspects of their faith that they uh, don't subscribe to. But he's vague and deliberately so. Why? Well, he's playing games here. If What makes somebody anything? It is the subscription to a set uh, standard or a series of principles. If you do not believe in the supremacy of the Catholic Church or the headship of the Pope, you cannot be a Catholic. Whatever you call yourself, don't call yourself a Catholic. If you're calling yourself a Catholic, it is because you subscribe to the tenets of Catholicism. So whatever he means by there may be many aspects of their faith that they don't subscribe to, well, if they don't su subscribe to Catholic tenets, then they're not Catholic. But if they're calling themselves Catholic, it's because they identify with Catholicism and therefore agree to its terms and conditions, as it were. I don't get to call myself a professional basketball player if I don't play basketball. It doesn't make any sense. You don't get to call yourself a college student if you're not enrolled in college. Or, perhaps a better analogy, you don't get to say you are a, uh, a conservative if you believe in socialism, for example. They're incompatible. They're mutually exclusive. So what does he mean? I don't think he knows what he means. What he means to do is to give people the impression that it's okay to be Catholic. I will not say anything against Catholicism. I will say uh, you might be a good Catholic and a bad Christian. That's, that's as far as he'll go. Now, it used to be on the RZIM website that they had an explicit uh, statement that said RZIM has no official position on Catholicism. Why would they? He routinely cites Catholics. He knows many that are saved and uh, will not call into question Catholic theology, which is the promotion of another gospel. Just like Mormonism, arguably worse than Mormonism, because there appears to be more that we have in common, but it is only apparent, ah, yes, the age-old angel of light who disguises himself. While they believe in the resurrection, they believe in the Trinity, they believe in the virgin birth, Yes, they also believe you can atone for your own sins in purgatory. They also believe that uh, sacraments have, uh, that there, there's an efficacious nature to the sacraments, that you must do them. They also believe if you're not a member of the Catholic Church, you can't be saved. It's an absurd dichotomy. Salvation by the Church. Ironically, there's many so-called Protestants, a lot of them in the Reform camp, that hold to this bankrupt ideology, too. I've had a few of them uh, uh, voice as much <laughs> toward me before. Um, people hold uh, Catholic ideals without even recognizing it. It's, it's a staggering, staggering situation we find ourselves in. But Ravi Zacharias knows many saved Catholics, many. Let me just tell you something. Is it possible for a Catholic to be saved? Absolutely. What does it mean that they get saved? Well, God will save them out of Catholicism. He doesn't save them to keep them in it. He will save them out of it. It is a matter of time. The Holy Spirit will not allow them to remain in that system. It's impossible. If he does, they're orphans of a degenerate father, and God is not a degenerate father. He will lead them out of that apostate and false religion. This, this creation of Satan. Ravi Zacharias, here's a list of his speakers and the RZIM team. Among them are a man named uh, Sam Alberry. 
Sam Alberry is a is a, a a prominent speaker in the Ravi Zacharias International Ministry team now. Here he is talking about transgenderism in the church. Listen carefully. What if someone is coming to our church, still is is self-identifying as as being transgender, but is then wanting to become more involved, maybe in in formal ways in our our church? I know a couple of people have been asking about, well, should should someone who's transgender be able to be kind of involved maybe in in leadership or in, in this aspect or that aspect of of church life that will depend on what our normal policy is on who we allow into certain areas of service within the church so that the condition for all of us should be the same which is that we are professing believers that we've had enough contact with those in the the leadership of the church to give the sense that we are sincere in our discipleship If a transgender person is in your church and wants to become more involved in leadership in the church, Sam Albury says, that will depend on what our standard policies are. What does he appeal to and what does he not appeal to? Sam Albury appeals to his own frail human reasoning and does not appeal to the Bible. Whatever your policies are, that's what it's going to depend upon. It's not going to depend upon God's word. It'll depend on whatever our policies are. Everybody needs to be treated equally. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me with this with this farce, with this satire that would would rival a comedy show? This is crazy. Welcoming a transgender person into leadership will depend on what our normal policies are. It might vary. This is one of the RZIM speakers. One of their international speakers, Sam Albury. This is Ravi Zacharias' team. Here's an organization he founded called Living Out. All about appealing to those with same-sex attraction. Again, he says, to help the Christian church understand how they can better help those who experience same-sex attraction to flourish so that... Uh, We have training events for Bible students and existing church leaders to encourage, equip, uh, equip them to build more biblically faithful and compassionate churches where all are encouraged to be more Christ-like regardless of their sexuality and where homophobia is not tolerated. Anytime you hear somebody invoke the term homophobia, it is in at least a soft defense of those who are homosexual. This is preemptive. Don't be a homophobe. It's a way to make you the bad guy or the bully. If you call homosexuality a sin, you're a homophobe. What else does it say? It says, repudiating all attitudes and actions which victimize or diminish people whose affections are direction toward, or directed towards the people of the same sex. Anyone <clears throat> who would diminish or victimize. Now, again, the language is vague enough that um, if you take a stand, a firm stand against this lifestyle and tell someone it is sinful and it must be repented of, and if it is not repented of, in, in what way can you have any fellowship with us? Uh, presumably, these men will say you are diminishing and victimizing those people. You're homophobic. This is what Ravi Zacharias is engaged in. Sam Albury is his team. Here's Ravi Zacharias with Louis Giglio and Tim Tebow. Louis Giglio, the Pope Kisser. Well, Passion 2016, uh, this is the conference founded by Louis Giglio, founder of Passion City Church. John uh, Piper was there, Christine Kane, and Levi Lusco, fledgling heretic and good friend of Carl Lentz. And Stephen Furtick, he actually calls Stephen Furtick his spiritual mentor. That's who Levi Lusco is, a good friend of the Calvary Chapel circuit. Indeed, his father, Chip, was a a uh, pastor, so-called, uh, of a Calvary Chapel for uh, several years, at least an assistant pastor. Nevertheless, Levi Lusco grew up in the Calvary Chapel circuit. There's Ravi Zacharias palling around with uh, a Hillsong Word of Faith heretic Christine Kane, John Piper, who uh, campaigned for Rick Warren, arguably harder than Ravi Zacharias ever did. 
Passion 2020 coming up soon. Louis and his wife, Shelly. There's the Passion Band Elevation Worship. That's from Stephen Furtick's church. The church in quotes. There's Lecrae, David Crowder. There's John Piper again. Up, oh, Ravi Zacharias. His other buddy, Levi Lusco, Trip Lee. The usual suspects, of course, Hillsong United and Christine Kane. Let's not forget Tim Tebow, who... Uh, this whole idea of uh, of, of celebrities um, pretending to be or thinking they're Christians, uh, from Tim Tebow to the Duck Dynasty guys to the um, uh, the the, ba- the band members of Corn, Brian Welch, and so forth, uh, this is a, a marketing ploy. Whether they know it or not, they're, they're being exploited, and these two groups are using each other. They're exploiting his name for popularity. Bowing down in an end zone and, and praying does not a Christian make. What Tim Tebow supports is heresy. I don't care how nice he is. I don't care how popular he is. I don't care if you think he's doing a great service by making the name of Jesus known. No, he's making names like uh, Hillsong United known and Passion and Louis Giglio. Oh, he'll say the name Jesus, but what he's immersed in is heretical to the core. Louis Giglio. Louis Giglio here at the Vatican. Eh, there you go. Greeting Pope Francis with a hug, and let's not forget, uh, let's not forget the kiss there. And there's his wife Shelley Giglio close behind. Yep, greeting Pope Francis, an antichrist. What, what a thing! That is Ravi's dear friend, Louis Giglio, the Pope kisser. There he is, and uh, Louis Giglio, the money beggar. Drop in and say I hope you're having an amazing week, and to remind you. That as a house, we're all leaning together toward August the 13th, above and beyond Sunday. I know a lot of you above don't and need any explanation. You've been on the journey with Passion City Church. You've been a part of Above and Beyond Sundays before. You're excited. Your story of Love Atlanta you can go beyond. So that as a house, as a family, as a church, as Passion City Church, we can go beyond where we normally go. And I just want to make sure that you have a personal invitation to be a part of this journey. God's going to do amazing things either way. He always comes through. But God has an amazing place for you in the story. Interestingly, we sent out 6,400 to personally invite you to open your heart, open your hands to the idea that you could actually give more. Give that more? you could go above what you normally give. If you're not normally giving, you could begin to normally give. That would be your above. But that you could go above. You could say, God, I want to be in the story of what you're doing in Atlanta, Georgia, and throughout the world through Passion City Church. I want to invest in that. So I just want to say thank you. Passion City Church is a generous church. We've been able to do some incredible things so far. Passion City Church is a greedy church. And Louis Giglio is a profiteer, a uh, charlatan, and... Uh, a man who, gosh, doesn't even have scruples by the standards of the world. It's it's shameless begging. And I recall Paul telling uh, uh, telling a church, the parents, uh, the children, not, not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. He said, I coveted nobody's silver or gold. He, wasn't, he didn't go on begging missions. You know what he said? These hands have provided my necessities, I believe, in Acts chapter 20. These hands. Paul worked. Did he receive gifts from time to time? Yes. Was it ever compulsory? No. Never. The one time you see Paul encouraging the Corinthians to set aside something, it wasn't for him. It was for destitute saints in Jerusalem. Please see uh, the video I did on tithing, which covers that extensively. When people talk about being a cheerful giver... They never give you the context. God loves a cheerful giver. Why don't you read the context? You deceiver. Who were they cheerfully giving to? The saints in Jerusalem. Agabus the prophet prophesied there was going to be a great famine in the land. And so they purposed to send relief to the saints in Jerusalem. And Paul says, when I come, have something ready. I've been boasting to the Macedonians for the last year. Uh, I don't want us to be embarrassed, never mind you, when we show up and there's nothing ready. And we will bear your gift to Jerusalem to relieve those who need it. It wasn't for Paul. It wasn't for a salary. It wasn't for a new laser light show. Oh, you can give above and beyond. That's what this is. 
This is business. It's all a big business. And this is Ravi Zacharias's friend. Not surprising. Here we go. Uh, what do we have here? Oh, there you go. If you're in Houston, says Victoria Osteen, wife of Joel, join us this weekend to hear Louis Giglio or watch him online. This was back in 2012. And uh, there you go, Lakewood Church, Louis Giglio, Saturday and Sunday, May 26th and 27th. And, yep, there he is. Louis Giglio on stage at Lakewood Church with Joel Osteen. He has always been a heresy supporter and propagator despite his apparent evangelical nature. No, no, no. He is word of faith with a, a new spin and more hair gel. That's what Louis Giglio is. That's what he has been. And that is a dear friend of Ravi Zacharias. He's so grateful for these dear friends, it says, and delighted to spend time with them at Passion City Church. Thank you, Louis Giglio. That's his friend, Louis Giglio. Who else is his friend? My dear friend Robert Morris has just released a new book, Beyond Blessed. It is a most appropriately titled book and by an author who cherishes God's blessing and knows how to distribute it liberally. To know Robert is to be blessed. All right. His writings carry the same inspiration and impetus that we all need in our lives. This book will be a great start to your new year. Be blessed and beyond. There's Robert Morris, Morris Beyond Blessed. When you see this sort of thing, uh, this this is the business of people that um, are under the same publishing company. They have obligations to promote each other. This is all a big back-scratching, nonsensical, hireling fest. Ah, buy his book. Buy his book. Yeah, I'll promote your book if you promote mine. You want to write a forward to my book? I'll write a forward to your book. That's right. We promote each other and build up our own independent kingdoms while uh, they take the exact opposite approach of John the Baptist. They must increase so that Christ can decrease. Shameful. Pitiful. But who is Robert Morris, you ask? Ravi's friend, who uh, we'd be blessed to be inspired by. Well, here's, if, if you thought Louis Giglio's shameless begging was bad, wait till you hear this. Now listen to me carefully, because I'm going to say something very strong. Any person that doesn't tithe is arrogant. Amen. Ooh. Because you believe you can make it your way and not doing it God's way. And you have to be arrogant to steal from God. Ooh. And you have to be arrogant to steal from God. You have to be extremely arrogant to steal from God. And please understand, if you don't tithe, that's an open door to demons. Ooh. Up because that's exactly what the enemy does. He's a thief. And you're allowing God. You're, I mean, you're allowing Satan to get you to, to be a thief. Ooh, Freudian slip there. He called Satan God. I think he's trying to tell us something. You're, I mean, you're allowing Satan to get you to, to be a thief, but not only a thief, but stealing from God. And I don't say that to make you feel condemned or to argue about tithing. I'm telling you, that's, a, that's an open door, and no matter how many doors you close in your life, if you're not a tither, you've always got an open door to the enemy. And this is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. He stole two things. He stole the tithe, and he stole the next generation. If you're not a tither, you open the door to demons. Well, the great irony, of course, here is that Robert Morris is the thief. Robert Morris is a thief by quoting God's word out of context as a pretext to extort money from God's people. He has no clue what tithing was about. The message in Malachi, uh, starting in chapter 2, was written to the priests themselves, not to the common people. It was the priests, first of all, who were robbing God of his tithe. His tithe of what? Silver and gold? What was the tithe for? Well, the tithe was inextricably tied to the Levitical priesthood, which no longer exists. Indeed, tithing has no bearing on anything we do in the New Testament whatsoever and was tied to the Levitical priesthood. If tithing is mandated, animal sacrifices likewise. Please see the video I did on tithing. This man is, is not just a liar. He's a bold liar and a true thief and arguably... Um, demonically inspired the way that he suggests that those who don't tithe are. Yes, uh, the show must go on. You better give me 10%. Find one example of tithing in your New Testament. You will not find it. When Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and said, you tithe your mint and rue and anise and, and cumin. Notice they're all spices. But you neglect the weightier matters of truth and justice. These you should have done without leaving the others undone. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Jews who are under the law in a temple system. 
sacrifices were still being instituted for at least another 40 years. Yes, as Jews, under the law, you should have done these things. But you've neglected the weightier matters of truth and justice. Spare me the tithing, you degenerate man, Robert Morris, you money-hungry lover of self and lover of money. That's Ravi Zacharias' friend. You'll be blessed by Robert Morris, says Ravi Zacharias, the man who threatens you with attack from demons if you don't give him 10% of your money. Brilliant, Ravi. Absolutely brilliant. Here's the Gateway Conference with Robert Morris a few years back. Thank you, Robert. Oh, that's thank right. You. Good friends with Joel Osteen. Thank you all so much. It's great to be here. Hey, that's enough. That's enough. Thank you all. Hey, it's my honor to be with you. I can feel the faith. He can feel the faith. Faith in the room already. And Woo. I told Pastor Robert and Debbie, the, the place is beautiful. I love, you know, it's a, it's a representation. I believe when we represent God, we ought to do it with excellence. And that's He loves things. He loves things things that uh, glimmer and glitz. He's got the mind of a magpie. Well done, Joel. And well done, Robert. But well done, Ravi. We'll be blessed if we know Robert Morris, who will lead you into the arms of this satanically inspired man, Joel Osteen. But never mind that. Robert Morris will threaten you with demons if you don't give 10% of your money. Yes, these are the friends of Ravi Zacharias. These are the men, this is the man he says, you will be blessed to know. I'll be blessed to know Robert Morris. The Joel Osteen promoting Robert Morris. Here's Ravi Zacharias recently speaking at the uh, ACNA, the, uh, what is this, the uh, Assembly of the Anglican Church in North America. Oh gosh, we could do a whole, here, let's play a game. Let's play a game. Guess if I'm Catholic or not. Uh, th there's so much more that could be said about this, but suffice it to say, one more notch in Ravi's ecumenical belt. Um, Ravi Zacharias, I was debating on whether or not to address this, but indeed, since there is, um, since this happened in the midst of uh, so much other spiritual um, waywardness, uh, it seems that this is related. Now, this isn't typically uh, an area that I want to venture into unless there's a, a good reason to do so, and unless there seems to be a, a solid measure of credibility about it. Uh, the concerns are primarily doctrinal, but as you will uh, see with many of these men, when there is doctrinal aberrance, very often there is some moral uh, deviancy tied to it, whether you know about it or not. And Ravi Zacharias, is he violating his federal lawsuit non-disclosure agreement? Does anybody care? Well... What, is he, what are they talking about here in this article? Lawsuit, not it's for many people don't know about this. I don't know. Uh, this this did not gain as much attention as I thought it would when I first heard about this a uh, couple years ago, a year and a half ago, maybe. Ravi Zacharias, from his own website, says this in October 2014. I spoke at a conference in Canada at the conclusion of my talk. I met a couple who expressed an interest in our ministry. The wife asked if I would reach out to her husband because he had questions about the Christian faith. As requested, I followed up by sending an email and a book to him and invited him to consider attending one of our educational programs at RZIM. Some months later, I traveled with my wife and our daughters to another part of Canada for a speaking engagement. The couple attended this event and invited my wife and me to dinner at a local restaurant afterwards. This was the second and last time I was ever in the same room with either of them. Subsequently, she began to contact me via the email address I'd used to contact her, her husband, after, the first, after first meeting them. My responses were usually brief. Then last year, she shockingly sent me extremely inappropriate pictures of herself unsolicited. I clearly instructed her to stop contacting me in any form. I blocked her messages, and I resolved to terminate all contact with her. In late 2016, she sent an email informing me that she planned to tell her husband about the inappropriate pictures she had sent and to claim that I had solicited them. Let's just stop there. This is, this is Ravi's own words. This is his own statement. So he acknowledges that she sent him inappropriate pictures. He says that he blocked her messages and resolved to terminate all contact with her. But notice what he didn't do. He didn't contact her husband. 
even though he had the husband's email address, apparently. He didn't attempt to contact the husband. He doesn't say anything that I immediately sought to contact the husband and say, hey, your wife just sent me some lewd photos. This is incredible. He didn't say that. Already something is amiss, even with his own statement. She planned to tell her husband about the inappropriate pictures she had sent and to claim that I had solicited them. In April 2017, together they sent me through an attorney a letter demanding money I immediately notified members of my board, and as they advised, I personally engaged legal counsel. So uh, he goes on to explain the, the details of what happened here. Okay. People are extorted all the time, and that's a, that's a legitimate thing. Uh, this happens in, in the realm of Hollywood and, and fame. Uh, c- celebrities generally have to keep retainer, uh, attorneys uh, on r- uh, retainer because frivolous lawsuits are filed all the time against them. There's always somebody trying to make a buck. And um, I don't think that that's something to be overlooked here. However, the way Ravi Zacharias handled this and the subsequent uh, statements that were made seemed to indicate that there was some culpability on his part. Now, I believe him when he says he wasn't in the same room with this woman. However, let's see. This is written by the Christianity Today International. The federal lawsuit, which was filed by Zacharias, not the couple, alleged that his friendly correspondence with the wife evolved over the course of 2016 to her sending him unwanted, offensive, sexually explicit language and photographs. In April 2017, the couple sent a letter to their attorney demanding millions of dollars in exchange for keeping the messages secret. It appears that they did try to extort him to some degree. That's what it appears. However, I don't think both parties are guiltless. Why do I say that? Here is the letter sent by Bryant Law Center. Um, this was April of 2017. So this is from their attorneys to RZIM and his staff. Uh, Down here, I can't highlight it, but it says, in an email, many lengthy telephone conversations with you. We have copies of your emails and the call register. Lorianne, apparently the name of the woman, informed you of her decision to tell Brad, her husband, about this misconduct. You responded by email that you would end your life and, quote, bid this world goodbye if she confessed and outed you to her husband. You later admitted that this was not true, and we have independent confirmation of many of these discussions by an anonymous third party. So they make reference to Ravi Zacharias threatening suicide and stating, quote, uh, that he would have to bid this world goodbye. Now, here are some screenshots. This is just from a website. I cannot confirm whether or not these are the actual screenshots, but they are in accord with the letter that was sent from that woman's attorney. October of 2016, Ravi Zacharias says, are you going, apparently, it's stated that it's from Ravi. Of course, the specific address is redacted. Are you going to tell him it's me? Then he says, and I've seen another version of this, this redacted block uh, presumably says her name, Lori Ann. You promised you wouldn't, Lori Ann redacted. Uh, If you betray me here, I will have no option but to bid this world goodbye, I promise. This is exactly what was cited in that letter from the attorney to him. Um, it stands to reason that the attorney wouldn't cite something that they didn't have proof of. And so this sounds quite believable on their part, on the part of the attorney. He he then says, apparently, can we not meet at least once before you do this? Please, please. Little did I know that that was the most dark and accursed day of my life. You will not hear from me again. So this completely corresponds to the uh, letter that was sent to him by this uh, Bryant Law Center. Why they would put in quotes something that was not provable, they wouldn't, is the point. And so while I cannot confirm that these are absolutely the screenshots of those emails, uh, it's certainly in accord with what was stated in that letter. And then here's the district court 
uh, Robbie Zacharias is the plaintiff here versus them. Okay, so you have all of this uh, information about uh, Ravi Zacharias and what he did or didn't do. Um, I don't believe that these people are guiltless. I do believe that they tried to extort him. Uh, you can read the rest of the letter. Their motivation was, we can handle this one of two ways, da 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 However, that does not mean that Ravi Zacharias is not culpable in what happened here. He makes a statement saying, the question is not whether I solicited any illicit photos. I didn't. The question is whether I should have carried on a correspondence with a woman, not my wife. And the answer is no, and for that I'm guilty. Well, it's a clever way to frame something and um, say something that admits to some form of guilt without disclosing the full measure of that guilt. Why does it appear so clearly that he indeed threatened suicide you promised you wouldn't if this is in fact him if you betray me here i will have no option but to bid this world goodbye i promise that is not the response of somebody who has nothing to hide if indeed she did send illicit photos unsolicited and she said hey i'm going to tell my husband i sent these to you and that you solicited them the response of somebody who didn't do that would say i'll tell him first Good luck. The correspondence is here. I don't have anything to hide. It certainly wouldn't be some ambiguous threat of suicide. They reached a non-disclosure agreement, and now no party can or will speak further about it. What were the terms of their settlement? We don't know. Did they receive money? Uh, very likely. That's generally how these agreements go. The point is... The spiritual degeneracy apparently led to moral deviancy as well. And while I don't know all the terms of that, the public relations team behind RZIM went to great lengths to make sure that this did not go any further than it, it needed to go. Did Ravi Zacharias threaten suicide? It looks like it. Did, was there a, a, a clearly inappropriate uh, correspondence going on with this woman? It appears so. Did he engage in physical relations with her? It doesn't appear so. Nor was that uh, what was accused. But he certainly got himself in a situation that um, was uh, a morally deviant one. And then apparently threatened suicide as some scare tactic, uh, some means of deterring her. Apparently. That's what it appears, judging from what her lawyers wrote and those redacted emails. Ravi Zacharias is engaged in, again, not merely dangerous activity, but for many years now, this is a long time coming, is deceiving people whether he knows it or not. Why is this so dangerous? I'll tell you why this is so dangerous. I'm going to close with a couple of quick quotes. Here's a, here's a book here, published originally, I believe, in 1959 by uh, Leonard Ravenhill, called Why Revival Tarries. I don't know if you can see on the top there, it's the name Ravi Zacharias. His quote on the book, this book has shaped me probably more dramatically than any other book I have read. Yes, many of these deceivers now have their names attached, attached or stamped next to men who would never approve of what they're doing. One such deceiver would be Michael Brown, for example, who uh, in his younger years met Leonard Ravenhill before his death. See, Leonard Ravenhill died before the Toronto Blessing and the Brownsville Revival and all of these crazy things. And though Leonard Ravenhill spoke much of revival and the men that he was initially introduced to, among whom would be Michael Brown, seemed to be doctrinally in accord with him. After Leonard Ravenhill died, these men went off the rails head first into a sea of, of, of charismania that Leonard Ravenhill never would have sanctioned and, in fact, would have rebuked and repudiated them. But nevertheless, they will exploit his name and therefore muddy the waters, right? Uh, because Ravi's name is now next to Leonard Ravenhill's name. So he must be good, right? Let's just read a couple of excerpts from... Why Revival Tarries. 
The conflict of the age is upon us. This unbiblical, distorted thing called the church that mixes with the world and dishonors its so-called Lord has been found out for what it is, a fraud. The true Christian church is born from above. In it, there are no sinners, and outside of it, no saints. No man can put another's name on its member role, and no man can cross another name, another's name off that role. This church of which, bless the Lord, there is still a small remnant in the world, lives and moves and has its being in prayer. Prayer is its soul's sincere desire. That's Leonard Ravenhill. Again, he says, Revival tarries because of fear. As evangelists, we are tight-lipped about the spurious religions of the day as if there were more than one name whereby men must be saved. But Acts 4.12 is still in the scriptures. There is none other name under heaven. To the modern preacher, does this seem tinged with bigotry? Elijah mocked the prophets of Baal and sneered with derisive scorn at their impotence. Better to run out in the dark as Gideon did and cut down groves to false gods than to fail to do the will of God. The Christless cults of deity-dishonoring mushroom religions of this midnight hour tempt the Lord God. Will no one sound the alarm? We are not Protestants anymore, just non-Catholics. Of what kind of, of what kind, of whom do we protest? Were we half as hot as we think we are and had a tenth as powerful and a tenth as powerful as we say we are, our Christians would be baptized in blood as well as in water and fire. And finally, prophets were martyred for denouncing false religion in no vague terms. Ravi. I inserted Ravi. And when we uh, when, when we too see lying religion, cheating men in life and robbing loved ones in death, or when we see priests lending them to hell under the banner of a crucifix, we should burn against them with holy indignation. Later, maybe, to lead the way to, to a 20th century reformation, we shall burn on martyr fires. You see, Leonard Ravenhill urged people to burn against falsehood with holy indignation. Indeed, as did all the prophets, as did John the Baptist, as did our Lord Jesus himself. And to denounce them in no vague terms. Yet Ravi stands there applauding the niceness of the Mormon tabernacle for hosting him and saying, at least we can uh, develop some moral soil together calling Joyce Meyer a great Bible teacher, partaking in the ecumenical 2016 Fill Them All event where Pope Francis gave the opening invitation. Yes, L Leonard Ravenhill laments, we're not protesting anything anymore. We're just not Catholics. It's absolutely right. Well, I'm not that, but, you know, we have a disagreement. But I'm not protesting. What a shameful fraud, as he called the church, most of what is called the church today is a fraud, an absolute fraud and an affront to Jesus himself. Weak. These men, these prominent representatives, representatives of evangelicalism today are hirelings at best and have gone in the way of apostasy. Shame on Ravi Zacharias, Zacharias now unmasked. And he's been unmasking himself for quite some time. Until next time, God bless and Godspeed.